Good afternoon. Uh, Your Highness Sheikh uh, Hamdan, it's nice to have you uh, join us for our session on online uh, education. Uh, I'm sure you all had a chance to listen to uh, His Royal Highness uh, Sheikh Mohammed bin Zayed's uh, speech uh, today, talking about the next 50 years uh, here in the UAE and combining the blessing of the oil and gas wealth today and how to advance the cause of a very diversified economy, particularly in the last 10 years when you look at trade, uh, finance, manufacturing, strategic uh, partnerships, for example, into aerospace. Now, none of this can happen to go to the next level, as he was suggesting, uh, without the proper infrastructure for education to the next generation of education. And I was thinking about this debate with our distinguished panelists uh, this afternoon, uh, that we're actually at a very critical juncture in the development of education. Uh, in the United States example, where I was educated in, uh, in university, we've seen since 1990 to 2015, the cost of education skyrocket more than 1,000% at the university level. Uh, some would say it's almost at a crisis point. Uh, we see because of the European Union under strain, particularly in the Eurozone and even in the UK, uh, the blessing of a very low cost education actually becoming a, a cost of say 10 to $12,000 a year and in some cases uh, with Oxford and Cambridge, a little bit higher. So the concept of a low cost education uh, that people have been used to for the last 50 years is quickly becoming a thing of the past. Uh, when you have a higher cost for education, what are the solutions that can be introduced into society uh, that can bring the cost down, but also broaden the breadth of society being educated at the higher uh, levels from secondary school all the way to the university education? This is where online education can serve a phenomenal role if we get the mix right. Now, there's been experiments in the United States, in Europe, in Asia, and I know through the, the higher education colleges here, throughout the campuses in the UAE, you're interfacing with uh, online education to advance one-to-one -one personal uh, training uh, with what they don't get in the classroom. They can go online afterwards and have one-to-one -one dialogue uh, with their tutors, which I think is phenomenal. An iPad for every student has been an initiative here in the UAE over the last two or three years with uh, great success. But the idea is not to look at what's been accomplished so far, to how do we take it to the next level. Let me introduce our, our uh, session of panelists here, distinguished guests that are from many different facets uh, of the education uh, sphere. Uh, His Excellency Jim Shelton is a former Deputy Secretary of the U.S. Department of Education. Uh, the person sitting in the middle here is a familiar face to the UAE community. Uh, Dino Varki, and along with his father, starting a, a very, very strong education program it was with its roots in the UAE, but uh, with big plans to take its uh, education model into the emerging markets of the world. And, and Anat Agarwal, uh, the chief executive officer of edX. Uh, this is a group that provides a free service online uh, implementation that we've seen throughout the Middle East and North Africa already, and we'll have you explain that model and how different curriculums can be shaped uh, going forward. Now, the other part of this debate that we see around the world today is that maybe in 10 years' time, we won't need bricks and mortar. We won't need the classroom anymore because we're going to be doing this all online. The early experiments in this space would suggest that's a little bit uh, too ambitious. But there again, it goes back to my initial points. There's a great opportunity to broaden the net for students all around the world. Should we start with you, Dino, on the, the GEMS example of what was built in the UAE but models that you can take into less beneficial countries so far, those that don't have the large budgets and where online education can actually work. Sure, I think, um, well, if I think about GEMS education, I suppose I'm the brick and mortar champion here. Uh, the reality is that for us, uh, we've been driven by a singular purpose and that's to try and make sure that there is quality education that's accessible to families uh, across the world across different economic segments. So uh, if I think about uh, the model that we're most excited about today, today in parts of India, we're able to deliver a high quality education where students come out, are able to access university for an average of $300 a year. Uh, that's an incredible thing to be able to do. And to tell you the truth, there are models in Africa where you're actually getting the cost of education down to 60 to $80 a year. And now this is a traditional approach. Um, it is about having a teacher standing in front of children, in front of a classroom, uh, and in delivering a curriculum that then enables these kids to go on and get qualified. So you've got within the traditional space 
a significant amount of innovation happening across different markets and across different economic segments. I think where online certainly has a role to play as far as low-cost education is concerned is typically with these models. You're dealing with teachers that wouldn't necessarily meet our definitions of a quality teacher. So where yeah. online has helped is actually to allow and give those teachers tools that allow them to deliver to at least a minimum standard. Uh, that's the first step. Can you actually get the underlying delivery of education to a minimum threshold that allows kids to learn and essentially uh, be successful in their future? So it's, it's more effective for the teachers than the students at this stage is what we're suggesting? Uh, certainly in the models that I've articulated, huh. absolutely. It's a, it's, it has to be a teacher benefit. Um, and I'm sure we'll talk about this in terms of, you know, can you ever see a full online provision? Uh, absolutely. You know, there will be different contexts and different circumstances where a fully online provision does provide access, um, is the norm. But I've always believed that you still need a teacher. You still need that guide, that mentor, that inspiration that is able to take children along that journey and take students along that journey. Uh, for me, before you even get to online, actually we perhaps have to focus on some of the fundamentals, which is can we get enough teachers with sufficient quality to be able to deliver to the millions of kids that today don't have an education? Okay, there's a lot of things we can cover here in an hour. Uh, the plan is to go for about 35, 40 minutes, and I want to have a dialogue on the floor with a lot of questions. I know the work that you've done at the higher colleges here, it would be good to bounce those ideas of the UAE model, for example, vis-a-vis -vis what we've seen in the United States and with the uh, edX model as well. And that'll come to you right after Jim. Uh, and I think there's been a big push, at, particularly by the Obama administration where you served, Jim, to get the universities connected and there's been pilot programs at university level, high school education level. But let's start now at secondary level education, getting high schools connected so we can get the remedials out of the way so students are best prepared for university. Give us some examples of what's working and what surprised you that did not work in that process. Yeah, so uh, first I want to just echo everything that Dino said. I think that the, the question about, especially at the elementary and secondary level, about whether schools are going to go away, makes us have to ask the question, what are we, why do we have our children in school? What are the range of things that we want them to learn and how do the relationships that they form, both with teachers and with other students, fit into educating them? Um, it's hard to do some of those things online, especially today, especially for our youngest children. When you start to think about high school age students though and post-secondary students, you do begin to think about them being able to branch out and learn and explore on their own much more uh, using the online tools and resources. So at the secondary level where you asked about, we've seen some really interesting things and we talked a little bit about this. Um, one of the things that's true is that um, technology allows you to provide access, access to rigorous courses, uh, the high-end courses like AP courses or foreign languages that you might not be able to offer in a high school because you don't have enough kids who can take it. You mm -hmm. may not have the teachers to teach it. This is particularly true in some of the rural communities where the populations are low um, where, in fact, through technology is the only, only way that you're going to get them access to high quality teaching uh, in different particular areas. Mm -hmm. The second thing is that people are leveraging technology to be able to share um, effective practice. And so when Anand talks, he's going to talk about how they're able to make some of the best teachers in the world in the given topical area available to everyone in the world. Mm -hmm. um, well, you're seeing that play out at a smaller scale at the high school level where students are able to access teachers who happen to be the best math teacher in the district or the best math teacher in the state. Mm -hmm. um, and that allows them to learn the concepts from that teacher and then engage with others at the local level to help reinforce those concepts as they practice. So I've seen those things work especially well um, at the secondary level. Things that have not worked well, um, you know, this will be probably the third time in, so many, in as many decades that we've said technology was gonna change education. Um, it was going to transform it. Um, and the reality is that every time we lead the conversation with the technology, um, it turns out to fail us. And so what I think is different this time is that we recognize that what we need to be focused on is transforming the learning experience and allowing the technology to help us do the things that are difficult to do without technology. Hmm. We often talk about asking teachers to differentiate instruction um, to be able to meet every child where they are, to know what they know, know what they know and what they don't know, 
what are they interested in, and how do they learn best. And we asked them to do that in a room of anywhere from 20 students to 40 students without the benefit of many tools. And what we're seeing now is that these tools and technologies are actually helping teachers to really be able to understand what the students know and match that to the kinds of instructional resources that are going to serve them well. Okay, good. Uh, do you want to spend a minute on the connected schools? I know uh, yeah. uh, President Obama has made it a priority to get what yeah. you said, 99% of the schools yeah. connected. Are you talking about secondary level education here? or Actually, it's, it's all of it. And so one of the things that is especially important since we are here at the Government Summit is how do you create the context for this kind of innovation and transformation of education to happen? And one of the big things is to create the infrastructure. Um, how do you make sure that every school has high-speed broadband? And not only does every school have high-speed to the building, but do you actually have high-speed connectivity in every classroom? Does every child have a device that they can actually use and have their resources on it? Mm -hmm. And do they have that kind of connectivity when they get home? Uh, it does you very little good to be able to have a school that is very content rich in terms of technology where you've got most of your courses delivered, and yet when the students go home, they can't continue that learning experience. Um, so being able to make sure that we get all of the schools connected and then that we make sure that there are mechanisms through public-private partnerships right. to make sure home is connected as well. Making sure devices are affordable, especially for the kids who can't afford them on their own. That's another part of it as well. Um, working out with the uh, folks who... It's a long, you know, it's, honestly, it's a long list of getting the variables correct. How so, far along are we in this process of getting those right? So the good news is I think we've made tremendous progress over the next four years, you will see in the U.S. connectivity to 99% of schools. That part, unless something dramatic happens, is virtually assured. The macro forces are pushing the prices of devices down. And so we're seeing whether it's tablets or Chromebooks or whatever the case, you're getting lower and lower cost devices, which is going to make it much easier for every child to afford one, especially when you spread the cost over multiple years. Huh. Um, you're seeing everyone investing in you know, interactive, high quality interactive digital content. Some of it paid, some of it free. That's going to make it even more affordable for more folks to participate. The big hurdle that we still have to tackle is how do we make sure that our teachers know how to take advantage of these mm -hmm. tools and resources to improve the way they are instructing children so that they actually have a different learning experience because these tools are available. Okay. Um, and then when we, if we fail to do that, then what we'll wind up with is um, people doing the same old thing using a new set of tools. Yes, and that's, that's a very good where point. Trying to go. uh, Anant, how do you fit into the equation with edX then uh, and where it applies to particularly the Middle East and North Africa? Now, I've uh, been you know, in the region off and on for the last 20 years, but living here uh, for the last four. And one of the biggest debates we have is how to train the workforce for the jobs of tomorrow. So if they're going to be working at Estrada, for example, a good engineering education, good mathematics education, and an understanding is vital. In your platform, can you match the skills demand with what's being taught? There's been a huge gap, I know, within, for example, Egypt, and I know Jordan's been trying to address this. How do you close that gap with the platform that you're offering? I think it goes much beyond uh, just a skills gap. Education is a right. Everybody needs to have access to it, just like water or the air that we breathe. And with today's technology, you know, I know we shouldn't lead with technology, but if you assume that education is a right, and if you have a technology that can make education available to everybody in the world, we should just do it. Mm -hmm. And uh, so edX, edx.org, uh, check it out. It's a nonprofit. Uh, it was created by uh, MIT, Harvard, and a number of uh, some of the best universities in the world that are putting their top professors and content online. We also partnered with... Uh, a GEMS education here. Um, and so the leading teachers and professors are putting great courses online that anybody in the world can take. Oh, I forgot to mention, uh, take for free. <laughs> so uh, free, it's like F-R-E-E. -E. <laughs> it, it means no money. I mean, just imagine being able to take great courses, be able to take the course on justice from Michael Sandel from Harvard. Oh, did I say it was free? <laughs> uh, or innovation, a course on innovation from uh, Bill Ouellette from MIT Sloan School for free. <laughs> and uh, with these courses, uh, people all over the world uh, are already flocking to them. We have close to 4 million learners from every single country in the world. Huh. We have 12,000 students from uh, Dubai alone uh, taking courses on our platform. And uh, these students can uh, get access to these courses. Um, our university partners give a certificate, a verified certificate, which they can use to uh, people are getting jobs uh, based on these certificates. 
We've also made, as a nonprofit, we've made a platform, the Open edX platform, also available for free to anybody. And what's been happening, once we made that available for free, many countries have begun to adopt our platform as online infrastructure for the entire nation. It's like uh, you have bricks and mortar schools, that's one kind of infrastructure. <coughs> our platform becomes online infrastructure. So for example, we partnered with uh, the Ministry of Labor in uh, uh, Saudi Arabia. They launched Durub together. Uh, with uh, Jordan, we partnered with the Queen Rania Foundation. They launched Edrock. China, Shwetang X, France, France University Numerique, India, Swayam. So we partnered with a number of countries that are launching national platforms using open edX. Oh, did I mention we made that available for free as well? <laughs> so uh, so uh, anybody can take, uh, I would be delighted to work with UAE and Dubai to take our platform and uh, create free infrastructure. And once you create this infrastructure, courses created on any other edX platform can be used freely uh, in, any, in any country. Good. What's the model when somebody can, say the UAE wants to approach you, for example, or Saudi Arabia, what's the initial discussion? We need to adapt the curriculum, put it into Arabic, and then roll it out? And how long does it take to roll out if, you, if a, a, a government wants to do so? So there's two aspects to it. One is uh, the platform, and second is the content. Think of the platform as establishing broad gauge railroad throughout your country. So once you've got broad gauge railroad, uh, you now need carriages and steam engines to run on that uh, railroad. So, uh, the, so we made a platform available for free, so you can just use that and create broad gauge railroad in your country. Uh, the second part is content. And for the content, uh, there's uh, two ways to do it. One is you build your own content. And we made available a number of courses also for free. So for example, uh, sponsored by Saudi Arabia, <coughs> uh, we launched a course called uh, Blended X on edX. So you can go to edX today, edX.org, and you can search for Blended X. It's an online course that teaches teachers on how to use online content within their schools to create the blended model of learning. And the blended model of learning is the future of education. So, uh, so one is you can create your own courses. Second is that you can come to edX and others, or our partners, and say, hey, can you create certain kinds of courses for us? Or can we license those courses? Um, through the help from uh, Jordan, uh, they implemented right to left on our platform. So we now support um, Arabic. And so uh, the, each of the nations does translations of these courses. And, uh, and frankly, because of Saudi and Jordan, they're already translating many, many courses. And so it, it is easy to see how by sharing the infrastructure and sharing the, uh, sharing the translations, we can really you know, make a big impact on something that we really believe is a human right. Good. The blended education, so we, we've all touched upon this theme here. Take me through it, Jim. I mean, what's blended education going to look like in five years' time? How much interaction are we going to yeah. have with the tablet? How much interaction are they going to have online at home, vis-a-vis -vis the classroom? Do we shrink the classroom size? We can dedicate more online. What's the model that we'll see in five years and even 10 years' time in your view? So I think what you're going to wind up seeing is as much variability in approaches as you see today, right? Some places is with 20 students. Some places is with 40 students. Some places, uh, especially at the post-secondary level, you're seeing people take programs from 80 students to over 1,000 students. And what it means is that you have teachers who actually understand how to use these tools well to engage all the students. And in particular, what is starting to happen is they're also starting to figure out how to allow students to work with each other in different ways so they get the benefit of working together and collaborating and sharing these resources mm. and being supports for each other. So what we're going to see is lots of different models emerge. If you think about the core of our traditional school systems, though, what you're going to see is teachers having available to them tools in the classroom that allow them to very quickly understand exactly where each student is, huh. where they need additional support, and to be able to help them get that support either directly from them as a teacher or maybe another student who's in the classroom. They'll be able to communicate very directly with their parents about what they do well and what they're not doing well. And they'll be able to share that information broadly across the school so that a principal in a school can look across the entire school and say, ah, well, this teacher is struggling in this way. Uh -huh. But as a school, we are not doing well in this particular area in math. We need to relook at our entire curriculum to understand how that Work. It's almost like a technology dashboard is what you're suggesting, isn't it? Uh, John, I was just going to add, I mean, just, just to your question in terms of what can the range look like, uh -huh. um, I think it's always important to set a little bit of context. And, and for me, I always start with 
again, teachers. If we look today at the potential global teacher shortage, now, if I work that number backwards today, the number of young people around the world that cannot even access a basic primary education sits at anywhere between 52 to 57 million young people do not access even a basic primary education. Just to meet that demand, so let's assume all of those 57 million children were today in a classroom. You would need, give or take, two and a half to three million teachers. Now here I'm just talking about a body standing in front of those kids. I'm not even talking about a teacher of quality. So let's start to put quality into the mix. Well, actually the global teacher shortage thing you're then looking at, eight million, 15 million, so that may be a shortage that's never bridged. And so what I actually think is going to happen with education is it's going to be the acute need that's going to drive us towards innovation. So I'll give you a simple example of our foundation does a wonderful piece of work in Ghana. It's called Making Ghanaian Girls Great. It's UK development agency funded. We teach 3,500 girls across Ghana, predominantly from rural areas, with five teachers. Modified curriculum, English, maths, and actually it's about women's empowerment and giving them role models to aspire to. It's very simple tech. Now these rural areas don't have internet connectivity and it's something that we may want to address later about how pervasive the internet needs to be. But yeah. uh, in these environments, all we do is we use very small aperture technology. So it's a VSAT enabled technology. It gets you internet essentially access through satellite. And then it's just a simple projector, a video, and a teacher sitting in a studio in Accra teaching three and a half thousand girls. So that's one extreme of a model. That's all on a daily basis, yeah. normal school hours? A daily basis, every day it's a modified curriculum. That's a great model that we're now rolling out to parts of Africa. It's actually a model that we think has a lot of relevance for children and families that are displaced by conflict. So if we mm. think about what we're going through in our region, it's an interesting model. So there, because there is no other alternative, you've got a pretty extreme example of a blended approach, right? It, it may not be as fancy in terms of the qu quality of the content that edX would have, but it does the job that otherwise would not get done. Mm. By the same token, today we figured out a model in the UK where we can deliver a low cost education in a developed market for about four and a half to 5,000 pounds a year. I'm using a UK example. Essentially, it talks about leveraging a great teacher. We would need to get that great teacher out in front of about 100 students, so that's your traditional pupil-teacher ratio. And then you break those cohorts up with facilitators, right? So you'll have five different cohorts. The facilitators are most likely to be, and let's just take maths as a subject. Uh, we're probably going to be hiring in uh, young people that are about to go to Oxford or Cambridge or the Ivy Leagues to study maths, because the reality is they're going to be better facilitators of that subject for our young people than most of the teachers out there. So that's a different model. It could be implemented today. But honestly, we couldn't sell that model to a single parent today because society isn't ready for yes. it and perceptions aren't ready for it. Well, you brought up a good point because, and maybe or not you can address this, I'm the last of kind of the baby boom generation, uh, two educated parents, you want to spend anything on that child, make sure they get the right education. Is this the last of that cycle where people are going to be willing to pay anything and not really question the results? Because I, I think we're on the cusp of something quite large right now that people are very sensitive to the amount of money they're putting out for education and what they're getting back out of that education. You're looking, private university costs in America, $250,000. And I'm sure you've seen documentaries and read a lot about this. Mm -hmm. What's the return on investment for $250,000? That's what parents are asking. Are, are we on the cusp of something quite large where people aren't willing to pay if they don't get the results they're looking for or not, in your view? I think we are on the cusp of a, uh, a complete disruption in education. Hmm. And you know, technology has, uh, has disrupted many, many fields. If you go back to uh, you know, the time when um, we had scribes write down on paper, and then the printing press came along in, uh, in the middle 1400s and completely revolutionized uh, the whole uh, transformation of knowledge industry. I think similarly, um, although online learning has been around for 30, 40 years, I think today's online learning is completely transformed. Cloud computing, social networking, global distribution of quality video has completely transformed online education. And, and the kinds of things we can do, we can grade all kinds of 
assessments, including essays, completely online. It's absolutely remarkable. And so I think we are on the cusp of a complete transformation. And to your point, we see two major forces. On the one hand, if you look at the US, the cost of education is, is, uh, is just absolutely uh, uh, disastrous. Uh, it's, it's gone up faster than healthcare or any other, any other cost. At the same time, education is the right. And still, you know, and, and yet people do not want to pay large sums of money for it. So we have two major forces, uh, rising cost of education at the same time, you know, uh, people's pockets are being, uh, you know, robbed by a number of other uh, uh, things. And so I see, a, I see online learning as a real solution that can, on the one hand, drive down the cost of an education. We haven't quite figured out how, but I do see a potential disruptor there in terms of not only improving the quality of education, but also increasing the efficiency of education. In terms of people, I think uh, people don't want to pay huge sums for education. But that said, I think that is going to be completely changed to where the new millennial generation is completely comfortable uh, doing things online. Where, you know, today, I'm not sure, how many of you have, uh, uh, how, how many of you find it easier to uh, text your teenage children than to talk to them? <laughs> so, so, in my, so in my case, when I call my son or my daughter, they're both teenagers, they don't pick up the phone. They yell at me saying, Dad, why are you disturbing me? But I text them, I get an instant response. If you haven't tried it, try it. Text them. They will respond instantly. The whole generation is completely different. And I think online and blended learning will be perfectly palatable to them. I think we can make it a lot more efficient as well. And I think that's the reason why I really believe that we are at the cusp of a true disruption in education. Yeah, it's coming. Jim, I'd like to have you jump in. Yeah, you yeah. spent time in this uh, latest administration in Washington. Yeah. And every person I've met that I've ever gone into the level uh, of a cabinet that you have had comes out with great experience, but also a great deal of frustration yeah. at the same time. Uh, tell us what you've learned uh, along the way uh, trying to advance this cause uh, uh, nationwide. Well, one of the things that um, actually went in because of a frustration, which is that one of the things the governments also often don't do well is create the kind of incentives that drive the behaviors that you want to see. Um, and so this lack of transparency on outcomes in the education space is one of those where for many years, because you couldn't tell whether you were actually getting what you were paying for, um, lots of other substitutes came into place. Huh. College reputation, et cetera, et cetera. Well, governments have the ability to create a context where, especially now, all of the data provides in a tremendous amount of transparency about the outcomes, whether you're talking about uh, set regular assessments at the elementary and secondary level, huh, or you're great. talking about completion rates at the post-secondary level, or you're talking about job placement and wages, mm. all of that is now transparent. All of the information about whether or not you actually got your money's worth is available to you, and governments have the, the, the ability to decide on what basis they will pay. Most governments today pay for education based on inputs. They pay on how many students go to school and how many days they go to school, and they put a certain amount on it. What if they pay per graduate? Mm -hmm. Wow. What if they pay per college ready graduate? Right. All of a sudden, you have a system that aligns all of the incentives. Now, you have to be careful. What are the second and third order perverse incentives that you're creating? How do you make sure that you reward people for taking on the most difficult students? How do you make sure that students who are at a disadvantage um, are actually being taken care of? Mm. Well, you can create a system that creates that kind of incentive where you get one thing for a really easy kid to graduate, but you get a lot more if you can take one of those kids who you know is going to be troubled and help them graduate. Right. There's a lot of resistance within the system because of the you know, teachers' unions. They're pretty powerful forces in Washington. How do you work around that where there's a resistance and then not? You can jump in or Dino. Yeah, in fact, I wanted to, uh, I wanted to jump in. Yeah, yeah. And uh, we've got to get an argument going here, which is that you know, what is amazing is that we have all this free content available. You can come to edX and take these great courses, and you can even get a certificate. We have exams. Yeah. At the same time, the US government, I'll just focus on the US for now. I think you should just say Jim. Uh, Jim. <laughs> Feel free. So uh, I didn't want to personalize it. So, uh, so uh, the US government will give you a loan of $20,000 to go and sit in a seat in some university, whether you learn or not, and you can get that, uh, get that loan or uh, the grant from the government. However, 
they won't pay you. If you get a completely free education online and you get the certificates, you cannot get that same grant. And so it seems to me that with, with, with just a stroke of a pen, if you can change the whole policy of the system to give you the funding if you're past something, as opposed to if you spend the time in a seat listening to something, mm. um, one could really leverage all the free resources and it would be, it would be a big win-win. So I think I agree in concept. Um, the, the world is moving. You talk about what are the big shifts, moving towards what's called competency-based education. So if you can demonstrate you have the competence, you can either get credit for it or, or make progress or whatever it is you want to be. The, the key here is how do we actually validate it? How do we know that whoever said that you had that skill, that you have that piece of knowledge, actually was a credible source? And once you can establish that, then you can afford to pay people on it. But what we have not done is set up the systems to make sure that happens. And so before you can just sign the thing that says, if you can demonstrate you have the skill, then we will pay you for it, you've got to have a really credible validation system to make sure that you don't have a race to the bottom, where all of a sudden people are certifying people so they can be paid, um, and you've created a new marketplace for bad actors. Um, that's one other thing that governments, at least I'll talk about our government, that we just have failed to learn this lesson. We create a great new market opportunity, but we don't look for what the incentives are for people who don't have good intentions. And so in our post-secondary space, for example, at the, the college level, there's a whole segment of people where we created one of the best systems for incentives for getting people into college in the world. We just forgot one thing, incentives for completion. And so there's a whole segment of our post-secondary system that does a great job of getting students in, and hardly any of them ever get out. What's the, uh, the graduate rate still now in the so, university system? So the graduation rate at the university system is still below 50%. Jeez. If you look at the community college system, it's actually below 30%. Wow. Um, and for low-income students, it's, below, it's lower than that. Uh, that's a failure. That, that is a complete failure. And yeah. it's, within our, it's within our control to do something about it. Huh. Do you know? What, where do you want to jump in on this one? One of the questions I had for sure. you was, you're presenting a model that you touched upon in your opening comments there, kind of the Rolls-Royce model and so maybe a Toyota model. How do you balance this out for the different markets that you're going into and where the online component plays into? Sure. I mean, look, honestly, the Rolls-Royce and the Toyota comparison doesn't necessarily work because uh, what I'm delivering to a parent for $1,000 may be a Rolls-Royce to them. If that gets that child into a university that they had no hope of getting into, if that gets that child employed when they had no hope of getting a job. So uh, the segmentation is only relevant when you're looking at it from a macro perspective. You can see the segments. But if I'm making a parent, if I'm a parent and I'm making a choice for my child, I'm not looking across segments. I'm looking at what's the best educational opportunity for my child. Um, so uh, I don't know if that answered your question. I mean, just yeah. it's very difficult for me to comment with this with as much authority on obviously the debate that, that Jim and, and Anand were having. But uh, for me, we try and break it down into really simple components, right? Uh, unfortunately, within education, there are a huge number of vested interests. It's not difficult. When you listen to all of us talk and any educator in a room talk, we'll all talk about essentially the same things. We all know what are the good ideas, what are the initiatives, what are the systems that allow us to deliver the right quality of education for our children, but there's a complete lack of alignment. Uh, there is insufficient political will at times. You've got vested interests in the form of unions. You've got private sector interests. You've got the bad actors. Uh, until and unless we can perhaps get rid of some of those vested interests, and this for me is a developed market debate, mm -hmm. by the way. The vested interests is, is a much more entrenched debate and intellectual debate that goes on in the United States, perhaps in the UK and the more developed economies. Uh, I suppose what's refreshing about where we are today, you know, within the Middle East, within the UAE, where we tend to do a lot of our work as GEMS Education is that uh, in certain cases, governments, frankly, don't have the funding, don't have perhaps the history or the legacy, and they're desperate for a solution that will work. So they are much more inviting of any solution, frankly. Uh, in a place like the UA, we're blessed that we have leadership that is bold, that's ambitious, and that's set a vision for the country that embodies the very highest expectations. It's created a very enabling environment for private sector to innovate. Uh, and you know, look, I'm fortunate, my family's been here 55 years. You know, they were teachers um, by trade. Um, we're not from the UA, but, but we've been given a tremendous opportunity 
to create not just an exemplar for the country, but today we're the largest private K-12 education company in the world. Mm. What we do across segments, what we do with our foundation, what we do with governments is honestly today a model that isn't replicated. And for me, we're, we're proud that there was sufficient political will that gave us the support and the encouragement to allow us to build this thing that hopefully we can scale and others can learn from. Good.